everyone to another one of our Pong Positive interview series. We've got a real good one today. Dr. Daniel Amen coming to us from beautiful Newport Beach, California today to talk about what might be the most important issue for us all, that's brain health. First of all, Dr. Amen, let me welcome you to our Pong Positive interview series. Wow, thank you so much. I have been a huge fan of table tennis since I was a little boy. So I am happy to be here with you. Well, Dr. Amen, you know, we really appreciate that you're joining us. And we have a lot of questions for you, especially at this time when everyone's at home and uh, everyone's coping with this uh, uh, lockdown and uh, we're not able to play, but we, you know, we are able to play visually. And I know visualization is a very big uh, thing even you know in your interview I, I watched a um, couple of your interviews and if you can you know share some of your um, insight with us how we can cope um, with uh, this uh, crisis at this time well you know, the crisis for me happened March 10th I was in my bathroom getting ready to go to New York uh, I have a new book out called the end of mental illness and uh, a nationally syndicated television show. The whole show is about my book and my work. And I was really excited, but I was also really nervous to get on a metal tube with this virus. And so March 10th, the lockdown came for me. They closed the studio in New York. And then just a couple of days later, they basically closed California. And that night I wrote down mental hygiene is just as important as washing your hands. We have to disinfect our thoughts, not let the ants, I call them the automatic negative thoughts, steal our happiness, ruin our brains and cause us to make bad decisions. So for elite table tennis players, it's physical dis discipline, but it's also mental discipline. And as a society, we need to really ramp up the mental discipline part of this pandemic, because when you're anxious, when you're sad, when you're isolated, when you're depressed, your immune system doesn't work right. And then you're more likely not only to get sick, but then to have serious problems from being sick. Once again, thank you for being a part of our Pong Positive interview series. Maybe give a little background, I'm not sure if anyone's done it yet, but a little bit of background on who you are and uh, your, the level of your experience and expertise in the area of brain chemistry and, and certainly uh, brain imaging as a psychiatrist uh, who is a brain disorder specialist uh, and been around for a number of years, uh, promulgating brain imaging, as I understand it, as a way of uh, diagnosing issues related to people with, with brain trauma and or brain issues. Um, we once again want to thank you for coming in today. And I know that there was a question earlier about uh, the uh, impact of table tennis uh, on that. Maybe that's where we should start is uh, what your impression is of the perhaps uh, recuperative elements of table tennis on the human brain. Well, that's actually something I've been studying and thinking about a lot, mostly because when I was a little boy, my mother was the sort of neighborhood champion. And when I was in the army, 1972, I turned 18, but I would literally spend five hours a night playing table tennis at the USO in Frankfurt and for a little bit played on the US Army team. Um, and I learned that different than the United States, that in Germany, there are table tennis clubs everywhere. And the day I got beat by a 10 year old, uh, the day I'm like, okay, I gotta get serious about this sport. Um, and then, you know, when I became a psychiatrist and started looking at the brain, I'm like, so is table tennis a good brain sport? And what I realized I don't know if you know, but I did the big NFL study, sort of when the NFL wasn't telling the truth about traumatic brain injury um, and football. And I demonstrated on 300 NFL players, high levels of damage, but also the possibility of recovery. And I've really been on a crusade, and, and I think the US Table Tennis Association should join me 
is that children really should not play games that damage their brain. That that's, I mean, it's insane if you think about it. Your brain is soft about the consistency of soft butter. Your skull is really hard. And if you look at the inside of the skull, see if that shows up, it has multiple sharp bony ridges. So if you agree with me that your brain's involved in everything you do, how you think, how you feel, how you act, how you get along with other people, um, and that when your brain works right, you work right. And when your brain is troubled, you're more likely to have anxiety, depression, marital problems, school problems, work problems, money problems. Um, your brain runs everything. Why would you ever put it at risk for a developing child? It just makes absolutely no sense from a neuroscience standpoint, but sport is critical to the development of the brain. And especially an area in the back bottom part of the brain, um, if we just look at a model, here in the back is an area called the cerebellum, which is Latin for little brain. It's 10% of the brain's volume, but it has half of the brain's neuron, neurons. And it's involved in coordination but also thought coordination. So doing coordination exercises develops the cerebellum, which, oh, by the way, has connections to every other part of the brain. So in table tennis, you have to get your eyes, your hands, and your feet to work together while you think about the strategy and the spin on the ball. So I think of it very much like aerobic chess, and it is great for development. There's a study out of England that said people who play racket sports live longer than everyone else. Football and soccer less long than anyone else. Running was third, swimming was second, but it's racket sports. And what is a safer, I played in the US National Table Tennis Tournament around 2000, and I think there was 800 of us in Vegas, not one brain injury. <laughs> so yep. This is something, you know, table tennis has a marketing problem. People go like ping pong, that's like a basement sport. When you play, all of you know this, it's highly aerobic. Like I'm sweating like crazy. It's highly aerobic and it's good for your brain. Doctor, does the technology currently give you an opportunity to analyze brain activity while they're actually engaged in a physical event, like playing table tennis? You know, the technology would allow me to scan you, and then after you engage in a training program, scan you again. Because of the movement of the game, you're not likely to get much good signal, but you clearly can do before and after. And there's a new published study on patients who have Parkinson's disease, that people who underwent a regimen of table tennis, learning how to play and then playing table tennis had a significant improvement in their symptoms. That's got to be very exciting because um, you know football's not going to do that and soccer's not going to do that. Um, but table tennis, because of the way the game is played, absolutely can do that. Doctor, just following up on the uh, traumatic brain injury issue, is, what does the research show with respect to, it appears that certain people engage in collisions and do not show any of the uh, symptoms uh, that you might say of a concussion, whereas other persons in a relatively uh, uh, more innocuous type collision uh, show full symptom symptoms related to that. What do you draw from that as a, uh, as a psychiatrist, as a neuroscience uh, person in the neuroscience field? Um, so you're right. Um, some people can walk away from a car accident unharmed and other people are permanently damaged. Why? 
It depends on the brain you bring into the accident. So it's a concept I call brain reserve. So if your mother behaved herself when she was pregnant with you and um, your parents fed you well and gave you learning opportunities and you didn't grow up with domestic violence or chronic stress, um, going into playing football, for example, you have a much better brain than if you grew up with toxins and stress. And so part of that is what you bring in. And then there's a gene, it's called the apolipoprotein E, e gene, um, apo E, and there's a two variant, a three variant, and a four. People who have the four have a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. And they actually did a study on boxers. So boxers who had the E4 gene started to show cognitive impairment after their 11th fight, where boxers who mm. didn't have, quote, the Alzheimer's gene didn't show cognitive impairment until after their 30th fight. I mean, everybody's showing impairment at some level. And I think in my 300 players, virtually all of them except one who was a backup quarterback showed trouble in their brain. Mark Thompson here with Dr. Dan Daniel Amen, who is a uh, psychiatrist and uh, famous for the studies that he's done on brain imaging. And we've got a number of people here in our Zoom conference, and I want to give everybody an opportunity to ask questions as well. I've, I'm informed that Art Dubow, who's on the call, is a, a person who's actually working with individuals who are suffering from symptoms related to Parkinson's. And uh, Art, if you have a question, just let us know. Chad uh, Nasinski, who's running the meeting here, can uh, unmute you and we'll get that question as well. I know, Doctor, uh, just uh, well, to follow up on another issue of, of brain health and promoting brain health, and we've talked about table tennis and coordination and how that could improve our capacity to, to uh, our brain capacity. What are some of the other things that you look at when you're trying to uh, assist somebody in improving their brain function? Uh, what are the things that you would uh, recommend to them to do so? So in my new book, The End of Mental Illness, um, I talk about if you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it if it's headed to the dark place, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. And we know what they are. And oh, by the way, these same risk factors put you at risk for death from COVID-19. It's really interesting. The book in some ways is prophetic. Um, so I have a mnemonic called Bright Minds, and it just helps us remember the risk factors. So B is for blood flow. Low blood flow is the number one brain imaging predictor of Alzheimer's disease. It's also associated with depression and uh, ADHD and schizophrenia. And exercise is the antidote to low blood flow to the brain, especially coordination exercises. R is retirement and aging. When you stop learning, your brain starts dying. And table tennis is a great sport. I mean, you can play that throughout your whole lifetime. Um, I is inflammation which comes from the Latin word to set a fire. And when we have inflammation in our bodies, um, it's like we have a low level fire that destroys our organs. We know it's a risk factor for mortality with COVID-19 and you get inflammation from basically eating processed foods, having an unhealthy gut or having gum disease. Um, so one of the strategies is you need to floss. You need to see your dentist. Uh, hopefully they're opening up now. And you really need to take care of your mouth. It's absolutely critical. Also, what increases inflammation is low levels of omega-3 fatty acids, which affect about 95% of the population. So I think all of you should be taking fish oil or you should make sure you're eating grilled or baked fish twice a week. The G is genetics, but we don't think of it right. I argue that genes um, load the gun. It's our behavior that pulls the trigger. 
So genes aren't a death sentence. What they should be is a wake up call. So I have genes that say I should be fat, I'm not, because I don't give in to the behaviors making it likely to be so. Um, the H is head trauma, a major cause of psychiatric problems that nobody knows about because most psychiatrists actually never look at the brain, um, which I'm trying to change because I think that's insane. Um, T is toxins. And, you know, alcohol during the pandemic, it's a bad strategy because it's toxic to brain function. Um, and, you know, one of the funny things is you know, alcohol is a disinfectant. Well, people don't know you have a hundred trillion bugs in your gut, uh, in your mouth, in your nasal passages that actually make neurotransmitters. They detoxify your food. They help you digest things. They're critical to your immune system and alcohol is a disinfectant. So do you really want to be drinking a lot? And what we saw during the pandemic is companies like Seagram 7 and Jim Beam started making disinfectant uh, because you know people can't go to the store. And I just think that's hysterical, but um, you know, better is a disinfectant you wash your hands with than drinking. Um, marijuana is not a health food clearly from our imaging work. But other toxins, like I'm worried about all of the toxic cleaning products people are using because whatever goes on your skin goes in your body and affects your body. And so supporting the organs of detoxification and one of the biggest organs for detoxification is your skin. And so sweat with exercise is wonderful to detoxify your body. Um, the M are mental health issues like anxiety, depression, ADHD, addictions. The second I is immunity and infections. When your immune system is weak, infections can damage your brain. When it's too strong, you end up with these things we call autoimmune disorders. So balancing it and a simple thing all of you can do is take probably about 5,000 units of vitamin D every day. It's been shown to enhance immunity, but also mood, and it decreases your appetite. Um, the N is neurohormone disorders. Brand new study out, low testosterone goes with morbidity with COVID-19, but your hormones are like miracle grow for the brain. So measure and optimize. D is diabetes. This is what kills people with COVID-19. They're overweight and diabetic. It's a lethal combination, but being overweight and diabetic also shrinks your brain. I published two studies that show as your weight goes up, the actual physical size and function of your brain goes down. So eating right is critical. Um, and then the S is sleep. Um, seven hours of sleep at nine turns on 700 health promoting genes. Making sleep a priority is critical. And one little tiny habit, in the end of mental illness, there are a dozen of tiny habits. The smallest thing I can do today that will make the biggest difference is before you go to bed at night, what I do is I say a prayer. And then in my mind, I just direct it to what went well today. In the middle of a pandemic where a whole bunch of things did not go well, um, I just, every day, what went well today? And I just find the beautiful parts of my day, I'll probably put this interview, um, so I'll review it later on and go, how cool is that? I get to hang out with people who love table tennis more than I do. Well, that raises a, a question in and of itself is something that, you know, we talk like self-talk for athletes, particularly, you know, uh, it can go in both directions. That people uh, get caught in the negative that things aren't going well for them or that they become, you know, quite the contrary, that they kind of capture the momentum by allowing their brain to just think these positive thoughts. I know, you know I played quite a bit of golf. You never see an interview of a PGA tour golfer out there where he doesn't talk about all the good shots he hit and doesn't say a word about the bad shots he hit. Is there validity to that? So when you 
So I call them ants, automatic negative thoughts. And I studied them. So I did uh, a psychologist who was writing a book called The Power of Appreciation. I did her when she, I scanned her when she focused on what she loved about her life. And her brain was actually very healthy. And then I had her come back and focus on what she was afraid of in her life. And she was actually really good because at the time her dog was sick. And so she let her mind go. My dog is sick. I can't go to work. I can't go to work. I'm likely to get fired. If I get fired, I can't take the dog to the vet. The dog's going to die. I'm going to end up homeless in Malibu. So all of this is happening. And then I scanned her and she turned off her cerebellum. So that part of her brain that's involved in court. And so when your brain goes to the dark place, you become clumsy. Your coordination is not quite as good. So in the um, professional athletes I treat, I, I teach them always to learn from their mistakes, but to be a good coach rather than an abusive coach because not only did their cerebellum turn off, their frontal lobes turn off. The part of your brain involved in things like forethought and judgment, impulse control, organization, planning. Um, so negative thinking disrupts brain function and the athletes I know that are highly successful generally see themselves doing what's right rather than what's wrong. You hear athletes talk oftentimes about being in the zone that at this a particular moment in an in a game or in an event that that all of a sudden it's almost like their brain clicks off and that they're just on autopilot but in an autopilot in a very effective and positive way that their end result is the one that they were ultimately seeking. What do you make of that? This concept of you know people just kind of clicking off into an unconscious zone, for lack of a better term? Well, it's that they get into a rhythm where their thoughts don't disrupt them. And that's why in table tennis, you practice thousands of hours. You know, our best players practice over and over again so that it becomes automatic. And that's where you don't want your thoughts disrupting you and the little ants they creep in and you see it when you see a golfer slam their clubs or a baseball player throw the bat um or even in table tennis where you know someone's just acting you know in difficult ways is their ants are attacking them you know i always say the ant will link with another ant they'll stack on top of each other and then they'll attack you so and learning how to, so when you ever you it's here's another tiny habit whenever you feel sad or mad or nervous or out of control write down what you're thinking and just ask yourself if it's true like i'm the worst table tennis player ever it's like no i've seen so many worse players right and so ultimately manage your mind is not positive thinking it's accurate thinking um and I uh, like a verse in the New Testament, John 8.32, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And maybe you can do better. It's like, oh, yeah, I need to practice this. I need to work on this, rather than call yourself names. Dr. One of our elite athletes, Angela Guan, has asked a question, which I think is uh, certainly in this realm as well, as the development of young brains, the development of young for even specifically even in the table tennis context young players as they go from you know the youth stage to teen to adult how their brain is developing and how that we can assist them train them to use their brain in a healthy and productive way well i think we have to teach them number one to love their brains nobody loves their brain because you can't see it you can see the wrinkles in your skin or the fat around your belly and you can do something when you're unhappy with it. But when I first started looking at the brain, I developed a concept called brain envy. So I wanted a better brain. So Freud had this concept of penis envy and I've just not seen it once in 40 years being a psychiatrist. So I just always say it was two and a half feet too low 
in the body. It's this what you need to care about. And if you care about it, you feed it better. You take care of it better. So teaching young kids to love their brains and the strategy is basically it's three things. Brain envy, got to care. Avoid anything that hurts it, know the list, and do things that help it. And know that coordination exercises in a positive environment are great for brain development. Um, but coaches that are nasty, that are negative, it's bad for the child's brain. You want to be encouraging. I mean, you don't always want to say, oh, it's awesome when it's not, because that's lying, right? The truth is really important. But there are ways to say things, and there are ways to say things. And when the pandemic started, I just adopted uh, my two nieces, who actually dedicated the end of mental illness to, because they grew up in, in a very chaotic home. My wife and I were sort of done with that. And so right before the pandemic, and the 10-year-old, I'm like, you have to play a sport. We're in a pandemic, half an hour of ping pong a day. And she was terrible when, when we started. And she didn't really want to do it. But, you know, I always say the best parents are firm and kind. And I'm like, 30 minutes a day. And so for the first two weeks, she didn't like it. And then she started to develop skill. And then she could beat her older sister, made her so happy. And now she texts me, like we just finished playing. Is it time for us to play? Um, and so we just have to teach kids early on that, and, and I could just see the connections being made in her brain. And it just made me so happy to watch. And as we educate them about brain science, and how this is really optimizing their brain so they'll end up being a better engineer or even a better partner because their brains are healthier. Um, it, it's a very positive thing. And what we could be doing is, you know, perhaps donating table tennis tables to schools and encouraging them not as much to do brain damaging sports. Well, congratulations, doctor, on adopting your two nieces there. How about the flip side of that equation? You know, we talk about young brains and how they're, you know, still molding and growing and that perhaps uh, training those brains might be a little bit easier. How about for us old folk? And we're ingrained with all these habits and all of these things that we've done over the years. Can you train a dog to, an old dog to do new tricks? I mean, is it possible? Is the brain that malleable even late in life? So your brain will be better tomorrow if you sleep tonight. Um, your brain will be worse tomorrow if you don't sleep and you eat terrible food and get drunk tonight. So what we've seen, I wrote an uh, internationally best-selling book called Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. And neuroplasticity is probably the largest advance in neuroscience in my lifetime that you're not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better in my NFL work. I mean, I have players in their 60s, 70s, 80s that when we put them on a brain healthy program that would often involve coordination exercises, fish oil, multiple vitamin and certain supplements that optimize the brain. In as little as two months, their brains were showing improvement. We're here on our Pong Positive interview series with Dr. Daniel Amen, who's uh, there in uh, beautiful California, psychiatrist, brain disorder specialist, uh, also an author of, uh, as far as I can count, an innumerable amount of books, and a very prolific writer as well. I believe that our chief executive officer, Virginia Sung, has a question for you, doctor, so I may pass it over to Virginia. I don't have a question, but I just want to say that, you know, the, not only table tennis helps the brain, but table tennis is a mind game. And uh, the opponent inside your own head is much more challenged to conquer than the one on the other side of the table. You know, I had, you know, doctor mentioned about um, notorious cultural parents. I actually had a notorious coach as a young girl. 
And she was really tough on us mentally. And that every time we lost a game, she would say, what's wrong with your head? Um, she would never allow us to find excuses except ourselves. You know, even when we lost to someone who's much bigger, stronger than us, you know, she would always find a ways to criticize our thinking uh, during in, or attitude during a game. And at the time, we really hate her because we're <laughs> just little kids. We really don't know about the thinking part or, you know, the, the, the emotion part. And, um, you know, so we had a reunion um, a few years ago, and if someone asked her about her method of coaching, she said something that was really interesting to me. She said that, you know, you know, anyone can coach your technique or strategies, and that's the lowest form of coaching. That's the lowest form of, you know, intelligence, actually. What makes the difference between a mediocre player and a champion is the application of the skill and that requires a lot of thinking. And I think what she was referring to is the subconscious mind. You know, our, our subconscious mind is so powerful. It dictates our emotions. It stores our belief, experience, memories, and skills. Everything that we have seen, done, or thought is there. So we're using our you know, conscious mind to get information on, absor and, and absorb their meaning, but underneath, it's our subconscious mind is processing the information. And we just have to learn how to get the skill set into our subconscious mind and have you know, that become part of us. So Dr. Amen, you know, we have a pool of talent athletes here and the coaches here. And um, we know that um, you know, I, I actually watch their uh, matches during Olympic trials. And I know that their technical level are really competitive but sometimes you can see their mind is a little bit um, not focused enough or they're afraid of winning or losing. So do you have any advice for our athletes with their very healthy mind, but how do we build the communication between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind? Because ultimately it is the subconscious mind that plays an important role in their success. So, not only is it repetition, it's coaching your thoughts to help you rather than hurt you. And when coaches are really hard on children, it may, they may play better, but then they're going to take that self-talk into other parts of their life, which might not serve them. I love the part about her really seeing it as a mind game because you know in the nfl for example all the players have high levels of skill the ones that really stand out are making just a bit of better decisions than the ones that are less likely to stand out so excellence in sports really comes down to the quality of the decisions once the uh, skill is mastered and trained and so accurate thinking and then very few people actually talk about mental discipline where you're um, developing habits that really serve you rather than hurt you by how not only you talk to yourself, but for example, in this day and age, children have no attention span. Um, why? You know, it's not everybody all of a sudden has attention deficit disorder. It's because we've trained out their attention with all of the gadgets and things that we have. So spending time with breathing exercises, meditation, and then directing your thoughts uh, in a helpful way um, is one way to connect. You know, what people think of as the unconscious mind. I really think of it as the patterns and the tracks you build in your brain. And, and people who are really masterful in highly anxious situations, they've figured out 
how to quiet their amygdala. Their amygdala is this almond-shaped structure deep in your brain that reacts to fear. And you know, if you're tied and it's a very important match and you have the negative coach, for example, um, your amygdala is lit up because you're afraid of what's going to happen. And then learning how to calm it through certain breathing patterns. There's a very specific one I like a lot. And it's been found to actually quiet the amygdala and activate your frontal lobe. So it's sort of the perfect balancing brain breathing pattern. And what it is is three seconds in, hold it for a second, and then six seconds out and hold it for a second. So if you can just take 11 seconds, do that breathing pattern, it triggers something called a parasympathetic response, which is actually the opposite of a fight or flight response. And it'll help quiet your mind so you can do what you need to do. Doctor, from a coaching perspective, it seems that certain players respond to stimulus different from, from a coach's uh, instruction. Some people, for instance, you know, for me, the madder I got, the better I played. Other people, if, you, if they become upset, it seems like it goes in the other direction. Is there an easy way for coaches to kind of identify who is my, you know, who's my student here? What's the, what is the best way to reach this particular individual? So in my work, I talk about different brain types that based on our imaging work, what I realize is not everybody's the same, that there are um, balanced people. If you are encouraging, they will do great. They're um, spontaneous people. They actually have sleepy frontal lobes. They're the people that shine when you get angry at them. In fact, at home, they're conflict seeking. They are drama driven. If things are too nice at home, they'll start poking people to create a problem. And they're often, um, the spontaneous and the persistent, I'll talk about in a minute, the persistent ones tend to be the mean coaches. And I'll tell you why. Um, so the spontaneous ones have sleepy frontal lobes and they always play this game called let's have a problem. And if mom screams at them in the morning, they have a good day at school. And if she's kind and sweet because she hates screaming because it makes her feel like she's a bad mom, um, he has a bad day at school. It's so really interesting. Type three are my persistent people. Um, they're persistent, they're driven, um, they like things a certain way but they also tend to worry, hold grudges, and if things don't go like they think they should go, then get angry. Um, and so on the surface, they appear selfish, but they're really not what they are. Their brain is rigid. So we do it this way, we do it all, it's always the same for them. And if you get outside of their comfort zone, it makes them anxious and they get upset. Um, now, you want some people to be persistent, like it needs to be this way. Like if you're a neurosurgeon, it's like, well, you want him to be a little obsessive about making sure that he doesn't leave any sponges in your skull. Um, so each of these types have pros and cons. And then there's the sensitive type. They don't do well being yelled at. Um, they um, make great therapists, but they can see the glass as half empty and more prone to depression. Um, and then there's the cautious type. They show up early, they practice hard, but they're more prone to anxiety. And you can actually tell what type you are. Um, I have a free brain health assessment online. We've had about two and a half million people take it. If you go to brainhealthassessment.com, um, you can find out what's your type and then my thoughts on how to balance them out. It, it uh, raises the question about 
coaching those and, and identify them. I, I would imagine that you would recommend that with each of those persons, it, it, you're, it sounds like you're suggesting that each of those elements has positive uh, por- portions of those characteristics or of, of, of those descriptions and bringing out the best of, it seems to me first identifying the type of person you're dealing with, number one, as a coach, and second of all, trying to maximize the positive elements in their characteristics, each individual's characteristics. Right, and and I have sort of a detailed description of this in Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, about how to manage relationships for different brain types. We've already talked a little bit about brain health and the connection with diet. One of the questions that's been posed is, how much healthy fat should we eat a day? And how do we identify that we're eating healthy fat, number one? And number two, how much is the right amount? So I am not a fan of low fat diets. Um, 60% of the solid weight of your brain is fat. If someone calls you a fathead, say thank you. (laughs) Um, When we took fat out of the American diet, our health literally went to hell. Um, the level of obesity and diabetes skyrocketed because we replaced fat with sugar and foods that quickly turned to sugar. But they're sort of good fats and not so good fats. So um, like industrial raised meats are really not good for you because they're raised with antibiotics um, and hormones. Um, and whatever the animals you eat ate, you're eating it too. So, um, so grass-fed, um, free-range meats are good. I'm a huge fan of fish. People who eat grilled or baked fish twice a week have more gray matter in their brain. That's, those are like processing units in their brain, which is a really great thing. Um, healthy oils, nuts and seeds, all of those um, are great. And I think probably a third of your diet should be from healthy fats. Um, my dad, who recently passed away, grew avocados, which you know I call God's butter uh, because they're so good for the brain. You may have to be careful with the calories because you know if you struggle with your weight, calories matter. And fat has more than twice the amount of calories per gram as sugar, but uh, fat satiates you, making you less likely um, to overeat. I think we got a question here, doctor, from Art Duval. And Art, I think Chad will unmute you and take it away. Uh, Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate, first of all, uh, being invited to the group. And uh, I want to say, I even shaved. Unfortunately, my video is not working. I apologize for that. I, but I can tell you, I don't look like Robinson Crusoe or Howard Hughes right now. But uh, you can't <laughs> see me. Anyway, I, I appreciate uh, the discussion, especially when it uh, concentrates on the ping pong. I am a volunteer at Ping Pong Parkinson. That's a group that meets at the Westchester Table Tennis Center in Pleasantville. We've been there for three years. And uh, we've noticed some things, although we haven't done any studies that are random controlled studies. Uh, what I have to report is strictly anecdotal, and I would ask Dr. Amon to comment on that to see if he agrees. But we have noticed that the players, the pink people with Parkinson who come regularly to our group and exercise for an hour and a half during our program and do some stuff by themselves additionally, have improved. There's no question about it. And some of the neurologists who have commented on this from Columbia Presbyterian have said the same thing. Although it's strictly anecdotal, I, I think that there is, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to say that uh, they haven't improved. There's some studies being done at a, uh, by a group in Hackensack Hospital now that's an offshoot of Ping Pong Parkinson, and they're going to be doing some some studies with measurement. So we're using instrumentation, which will be better controlled and will be much less subjective than what I'm saying now. However, what I would ask Dr. Amen, and what we have observed and concluded after three years is that our ping pong group 
which is a little eclectic. We do juggling and some other exercises as well. And it's become a social group. It's as important as taking the medication. <laughs> if they don't exercise, they regress after a few weeks or a month or two. They have to keep it up. What we have come to think of ourselves as is a dopamine group. So I would ask Dr. Amen to comment on the idea that it's crucial to exercise for people with Parkinson's. You know, Art, I just agree with you completely. There was a study that was going to be presented at the American Academy of Neurology um, where they took 12 players, 12 people with Parkinson's and put them through a table tennis training regimen and they showed significant improvements. And I would argue that exercise is the first treatment if you begin to get Parkinson symptoms because exercise activates the cerebellum, it goes and activates a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. That's what dies in Parkinson's disease. You don't get enough dopamine input because some of the some basal ganglia, dopamine cells die. Um, and so trying to activate them is really important. But, you know, too often we don't know why people have symptoms. And in my book, The End of Mental Illness, I go after, well, why do you have Parkinson's disease? Or why do you have Alzheimer's disease? I mean, just because somebody describes it doesn't tell you one thing about what causes it. And with Parkinson's, yes, there's a genetic component, but there's also a toxic component. Do Have you been exposed to heavy metals? Um, are you in a job where environmental um, toxins are available? I, I do a lot of work with firefighters and a lot of them are exposed to toxins. And so getting rid of the toxins is just so important. Um, so anyways, I appreciate your question and could not agree with you more. I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity. If you have a question for Dr. Amen before we let him go, I'll just uh, say to him, just generally, doctor, we all extend the invitation on behalf of USA Table Tennis. Our next big event that we're hoping for is going to be in December in Las Vegas, the U.S. Nationals. I, you noted it earlier, and I looked it up. I think you may have played the Nationals in 99. I said it earlier. You're a, you're a legit 1,500, 1,600 player. So you're, a, you're obviously training there with your nieces and others at home. So there's no reason, there's no excuse right now not to be a part of the U.S. Nationals in December in Las Vegas. Oh, it's such a joy. You know, I love uh, playing so much. It's just, you know, my life got away from me. But uh, I, I am just, your, you know, one of your biggest scientific supporters. And, and we need to do more so that children have alternatives to soccer, you know, which is bad for your brain. There's all sorts of studies showing that. Football, which is bad for your brain. And it's so funny, my brother, he laughed at me when I did my big NFL study. He's like, what, you want everybody to play table tennis? And I absolutely do. Yeah. It's a better <laughs> sport for developing brains. And somebody should be telling the truth. I was a consultant on the movie Concussion. And there's a line in it that I just hate, but it's true that the NFL owns a day of the week. This is not okay. Um, in the end of mental illness, I talk about, I just imagined if I was an evil ruler and I wanted to increase the incidence of mental illness in America, well, what would I do? And one of the strategies is have the NFL own a day of the week where, you know, if you say anything against football, people think you're a heretic, like you're not really American. And it's, we need to say the truth. Brain damaging sports are stupid for children. I mean, you know, when you really understand the neuroscience, it's abusive or neglect, you choose 
to allow developing brains to be put at high levels of risk. We have alternatives. Table tennis is one of the best ones. Well, we certainly thank you for saying that, Doctor, and I know that you, you mean it when you say it. I want to thank you for being part of our Pong Positive interview series. I want to give Virginia an opportunity to have the last word with you here and give you the last word, actually. But personally speaking, I want to thank you very much. Very enlightening hour that we spent here talking about brain health, brain chemistry. And I know that people, if you just look on the web, they're going to find all sorts of uh, information, including the list of books that seems to go on forever that, that you've actually uh, written and uh, other information as well. On our chat right now, there is the, the site for the brain health assessment as well, which you talked about earlier. But with that, Virginia, I'll turn it over to you to um, thank Dr. Amen as well. Yes, thanks so much, Dr. Amen, that we will definitely cut our alcohol consumption from one glass <laughs> A two glass wine to one and then start eating avocado and then start meditating. Um, I think the method of breathing about, you know, taking 30 seconds in and then hold it for a second. That's really a Chinese uh, qi uh, method that I actually been practicing for over 10 years. And it, it is really helps you to stay young and then clear up your mind too when you you know give a lot of oxygen to your mind when you meditate it's really about breathing about getting more oxygen to you know different part of your organs and your brain so definitely you know this is so helpful and we thank you so much and we look for forward to the opportunity to work with you in the future well thank you all what a joy for me to be with you and I hope all of you stay safe, uh, healthy, and happy during this challenging time. Thank you. Thanks, thank you sir. again, Dr. Amen. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for coming out. And please stay Pong positive. Thanks again.